Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining our Borlaug Dialogue webinar. We will be getting started here shortly. However, in the meantime, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Additionally, using the naming feature in Zoom, please change your Zoom name to list your name and the organization you are coming from. Thank you to everyone who is joining. We're gonna get started here in about a minute. Um, however, um, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat with your name and the organization you are coming from. Um, please free, feel free also to change your Zoom name to your name and the organization you are coming from. All right, hello and thank you for joining us today. This webinar is part of the World Food Prize Foundation's annual Borlaug Dialogue. We, in this webinar, we will be discussing utilizing adaptive management to harness change, lessons from the Feed the Future DRC Fall Armyworm activity. Each year, the Borlaug Dialogue brings together individuals from more than 65 countries to address cutting edge issues related to global food security and nutrition through a series of virtual and in-person events. Today's event is hosted by Lando Lakes Venture 37. Lando Lakes Venture 37 is an independent 501c3 nonprofit affiliated with Lando Lakes Inc. Venture 37 implements agri-food system development programs globally with a focus on building resilient systems, competitive markets, nutrition secure communities, and inclusive societies. My name is Rebecca Chamberlain, and I'm a technical advisor for resilience and climate adaptation with Lando Lakes Venture 37, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Before diving in, I want to go over a few housekeeping items. Again, please introduce yourself in the chat and change your name on Zoom to list both your name and organization. I also want to let everyone know that this session is being recorded. We will have some time at the end of the session for our presenter presenters to answer questions you may have. So please submit all questions via the Q&A feature and we will try our best to answer them during today's session. There is an upvote feature you can use if you see someone has the same question as you or if you see a particularly compelling question that you also want answered. All right, let's get started. So for those of you who attended the Borlaug Dialogue last year, you may recall that the theme focused on the ongoing impacts of COVID-19, climate change, and conflict. This year's theme is, focusing, is focused on harnessing innovation, adaptation, and diversification to improve systemic resilience, recover from shocks, and sustainably nourish all people. Our conversation today will discuss the role of adaptive management to enable development projects to be flexible and responsive in the face of change. To provide a real life example of adaptive management at work, our panelists will discuss how the USAID funded Feed the Future DRC Fall Armyworm activity is using adaptive management to build resilience and empower Congolese farmers and agricultural businesses. Fall armyworm is a destructive pest native to the Americas, which was first reported in Africa in 2016. Since then, devastating outbreaks of fall armyworm have been reported across Africa, leading to significant yield losses, particularly for maize, a staple for many African countries. According to research from the University of Minnesota, almost the entire African maize crop is grown in areas with climates that support seasonal infestations of fall armyworm, and almost 92% of Africa's maize area supports year-round growth of the pest. In DRC in particular, a 2017 report conducted by the Center for Agriculture and Bioscience International 
found that 90% of maize fields were infested by fall armyworm, costing the country about 270 million US dollars in losses. Therefore, devising effective strategies for the control of fall armyworm is critical for the resilience of the African agricultural sector and for the livelihoods of African maize farmers. Uh, next slide, please. Today, you will be hearing from team members of our Feed the Future DRC Fall Armyworm activity on their experience using adaptive management to devise and disseminate effective strategies for Congolese farmers to combat fall armyworm. However, first, we will hear from our keynote speaker, Jamie Leifker, who is the Vice President of New Markets and Growth Initiatives for Winfield United, a subsidiary of Lando Lakes, Inc. Winfield United provides farmers with agriculture solutions, products, and services to help them make the right decisions from planning through harvest. At Winfield, Jamie's team provides timely and actionable insights to help retailers and farmers arrive at a more profitable outcome. Jamie has experience in sales, marketing, agricultural technology, and business development, which supports his team's ability to provide meaningful solutions that lead to increased return on investment, supported by input use efficiency, increased yield and quality, and carbon capture. In his free time, Jamie likes to spend time at the farm his wife manages in Iowa, which is just down the road from Norman E. Borlaug's childhood farm, for whom the Borlaug Dialogue is named. Our next panelist, Mustafa Gai, is the chief of party of the USAID funded Feed the Future DRC Fall Armyworm activity. Mustafa has over 30 years of international development experience, 16 of which have been in chief of party roles for large US government funded programs. He is experienced in agriculture, community engagement, gender integration, private sector engagement, and adaptive management. He holds a master's degree in agricultural economics from New Mexico State University in the US and a master's degree in economics from the University of Dakar in Senegal. Our final panelist, Daniel Niedermeyer, is a senior manager on Venture 37's global monitoring, evaluation, and learning team and provides support to the DRC Fall Armyworm activity. She has over 15 years of global development experience across 18 countries in crops, livestock, private sector engagement, market systems development, women's empowerment, and adaptive management. Danielle started her development career as a sustainable agriculture Peace Corps volunteer in Senegal and has a master's degree from Cornell University. Now I will turn it over to Jamie for his perspective on the importance of adaptive management for the agriculture sector and its application in Winfield's work. Thank you, Rebecca, and good day, all. I'm calling you here from my, my farm in Iowa, uh, which Rebecca said is ironically just a few miles down the road from where Norman Borlaug grew up in Cresco, Iowa. I'd hope to broadcast from there today, but the cellular signal isn't, wasn't strong enough for me to dependably do so. Here in Iowa, we're currently harvesting, almost done with soybeans and about, and about half done with corn. And this year is likely to go down in history with some of the highest yields per inch of rain received during the entire growing season. We're so thankful for the better genetics that we have available and at our disposal. We're, we're thankful for the, the ability to better place those genetics on the right field to maximize potential. We're thankful for the, the, the learnings that we've had on how to manage genetics throughout the growing season to maximize yield. And then we're, we're even more thankful for the brilliant minds of, of R&D individuals, many of you on this call, whose curiosity sparks innovation toward delivering food security. It's, it's very important to leverage data and to learn and to iterate in agriculture and in food systems more broadly, especially with a, a, a changing climate along, alongside the, the changing political environment and changing policies that, that we're experiencing. And climate change and food security, while they're global issues, they're, they're disproportionately affecting people in low to middle income countries. Now, in the United States, it's important to keep in mind how our own security is impacted by global food security, and all these inner, all these issues are closely intertwined. As Rebecca mentioned, I work for a company called Winfield United, and we partner with retailers here in, in the U.S., ag retailers in the U.S. and around the world, to shape the future of agriculture by, by accelerating our system relevancy and, and the growth within that, 
that system that we've that we've combined. Together, we provide farmers with agriculture solutions, products, and services to help make the right decisions with farmers from planting all the way through harvest. And we drive system relevance through our retailers' position as as being the trusted advisor with the farmer, which in, which invites innovators and innovation in the space to come to us with new technology and methods to trial in our proving grounds to accelerate that adoption in their in the local environments. Now, Winfield United and Venture Thirty Seven are business units uh, within our parent company, Lando Lakes, and and we're connected by our commitment to promote agricultural solutions to meet the industry's ever-changing needs, as well as our commitment toward uh, working towards sustainable, sustainable development goals, particularly related to food security. Now, specific to production and, and R&D, in, in thinking about the system we deploy to maximize food security, the thought process is very simple. Executing it, however, and staying committed to it is the hardest part. And as mentioned, we, we use an, appro an, an approach called adaptive management. We have over a hundred research centers across the US that we call answer plots, in addition to others in, in, in Canada and South Africa and expanding around the world. And when we started, it was all about education with these research, research centers, hands-on training and demonstration, while at the same time we were testing products in, in, in farmers' fields. Then we moved to a more data-driven platform to verify seed adaptability to given geographies and environments by taking the variability out of our sites that the farmers would experience in their field so that we could better place the right product on the right acre. So, so it's important to test with and without the variables and then leverage advanced analytics to model outcomes to best place products to get the greatest return. Now, after, after we got really good here in the US, um, uh, identifying the right varieties, we, we began and we evolved our business to, to match the most rewarding and responsive agronomic practices. Again, starting, starting in our research centers where we can isolate against specific variables and then moving them onto the farm where we introduce that variability back into the backed in, into the production system. If, if, you, if you try to relate to it, it's kind of like raising a child. Each genetic background is unique and each, each thrives better in the appropriate environment and how we raise them during their lifetime. A plant is really no different. We, we're capturing millions of data points and we're pushing them into one data platform where we can apply advanced analytics and data science. Now we've over time we've keyed in on four areas um, around agronomic factors to apply to these genetics that we find most responsive. They are nitrogen, seeding rate, fungicides for plant health and disease, and biologicals for stress reduction. We found them to be the the economically the four most important things that we can control after we place the right genetics on the acre. And I don't know why you couldn't you couldn't do the same with the fall armyworm project for the feed the future project here that we'll that we'll be looking at during this webinar and taking a similar approach, implementing research plots on farmers fields and tailoring recommendations based on based on those findings. At, at the end of the day, our the system that we put in place and the system that I know the project is working on. Um, we'll be able to place a product on the right acre with the right agronomic program better than anyone in the industry to help the farmer get the greatest return and maximize production. And through this journey, our research centers have been become less about demonstration, even though it's still important. But now it becomes all about the data. Where we want to get to is a place where we can better collect data, understand the environment all the way to a farmer's field level along with understanding the, the planned practices that that farmer has intended and leverage that leverage data to model the outcomes to provide a better product recommendation for the entire acre. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for that all that you do in your endeavors to feed the world. Thank you.
Hey, Jamie, thank you for those thoughts and for telling us more about how Winfield United uses adaptive management for applied research. Now I will turn it over to Danielle Niedermeyer and Mustafa Guy to learn how Venture 37 is using adaptive management to devise and disseminate effective strategies for Congolese farmers to combat fall armyworm. Thank you very much, Rebecca. And thank you, Jamie, for providing a great overview of how Winfield is implementing adaptive management through the AnswerPlot system. Um, so I'm going to start off by providing a brief overview of what we mean by adaptive management. But first, I'd like to hear from all of you. So please, next slide, um, put in the chat, uh, not this poll real quick, sorry. Um, let's start with putting in the chat, what do you, uh, what words come to mind when you hear adaptive management? So go ahead and, and throw some thoughts in the chat. Um, responsive, learning, agility, learning, tailored, proactive, data. Great. Yeah, lots of great words. Openness, change, synergy, proactive, pivot, flexibility, fit for purpose. This is wonderful. Making updates, observations, iterative. I'm seeing learning a lot here. Yeah, learning from action, agile change. Perhaps crises can stimulate adaptive management, certainly. Great, uh, using data to learn, absolutely. Great, well, so we'll keep going um, and feel free to keep adding more thoughts in the chat here as we go. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of those of us in global development, so we often struggle to impl implement adaptive management for a variety of reasons. We have detailed work plans that are hard to adjust. We have funders who have varying degrees of openness to change, to making changes in planned activities and operations. Uh, the project that we'll be speaking about today is funded by USAID. And as many of you likely know, USAID has embraced adaptive management for quite a while. And we're very grateful for them, for their openness um, to us adjusting activities and operations so we can have the greatest impact possible. Given these ever-changing contexts in which we work, implementing adaptive management really should become a standard mode of how we operate. So Venture 37 defines adaptive management as the intentional process of updating our project plan to achieve results based on new evidence about project performance and the external environment. I know that's a bit of a mouthful, mouthful but we really wanted to be specific in how we're defining um, what we mean by adaptive management. Uh, the definition here is on the slide, uh, but if you have thoughts about how we might improve or change this definition, certainly feel free to add those thoughts in the chat. We'd love to hear them. A growing body of evidence indicates that specific aspects of adaptive management contribute to improved organizational and development outcomes. So adaptive management is not just um, you know, important for, for our changing context, but it actually improves organizational effectiveness and development outcomes, specifically in terms of organizational effectiveness. Um, strategic collaboration and taking time to pause and reflect on our work improves performance of an organization. Additionally, continuous learning is linked with job satisfaction, empowerment, employee engagement, and ultimately improved performance and outcomes. In terms of development outcomes, uh, when MEL is incorporated into program management and design to support learning and decision, decision making, it's positively and significantly associated with achieving development outcomes. In addition, adaptive management contributes to achieving development outcomes, particularly when there is leadership support, public support, and an adequate investment of time for adaptive management. Uh, we'll put a link in the chat here with the USA resource that highlights some of these wonderful benefits of adaptive management. And we're grateful to USAID for having collated these benefits. Next slide, please. So now we'll jump to that poll question. How familiar are, we'll get that up here in a second, <clears throat> how familiar are you with this USAID collaborating, learning, and adapting framework? 
are you very confident? Maybe you could be here presenting instead of me. Uh, somewhat confident, you understand the concept, but maybe you don't implement it regularly or not at all confident and you're excited to learn more about it today. I'll give you all a few moments here to, to respond. Great, we'll <clears throat> give you all maybe just another few moments. And go ahead and close the poll if we've gotten enough responses here. Great, so it looks like, hopefully you guys can all see the results here popping up too. Um, looks like a fair number of you are very confident. Most are somewhat confident and several not confident at all. So great to hear a good mix. Um, and certainly those of you who are somewhat confident or not at all confident, um, hopefully you'll learn more about this framework um, and look forward to using it as you move forward. Um, so USAID released this CLA framework several years ago to help USAID staff and implementing partners more intentionally and systematically implement adaptive management. It includes two key dimensions, which each have three components and then additional subcomponents. The first dimension is enabling conditions. This includes how an organization's culture, business processes, and resource allocation support CLA integration. The second dimension, is CLA in the program cycle. This includes how CLA is incorporated throughout the program cycle processes, including strat strategy, project, and activity design and implementation. USA believes that organizations need both integrated CLA practices appropriate for their context and conducive enabling conditions to become stronger learning organizations capable of managing adaptively. This framework stresses the holistic and integrated nature of the various components of CLA to reinforce the principle that CLA is not a separate work stream. It should be integrated into existing processes to strengthen the discipline of development and improve development effectiveness. Venture 37 has been using this framework with our prog programs ever since, essentially ever since it came out. As we did, we realized our program teams could use additional guidance on how best to plan for and implement adaptive management. So we uh, developed our own adaptive management toolkit building off of this framework. Next slide, please. Our adaptive management toolkit includes a guidebook that is a brief 10 page document that explains what adaptive management is. We have several tools included in the toolkit that can be used to implement this process. And we've broken our process of adaptive management into three steps. The first one, plan. Project leaders need to plan for the processes that will facilitate adaptive management and the allocation of resources to ensure these processes can be implemented. Step two, build culture. And this is really, really essential. Uh, this involves establishing a culture within the project in which all staff are empowered to ask questions, test assumptions, and feel comfortable to both succeed and fail. And this is so important that I'm gonna spend a specific slide speaking about how this project has, has worked to build culture. Step three is learn ad and adapt. So that's really you know, the heart of adaptive management. This is when learning occurs. The project implements planned activities to review data and reflect on what they mean. These learnings are then used to adjust activities. These adjustments may require changes to existing or additional plans for adaptive management. And the tools for this step are organized into three subcategories, collect data, review data, and then adapt activities. Of course, these three steps are interdependent. They all work to enable and reinforce the other steps. Sometimes it's necessary to go back to an earlier step in order to adjust adaptive management plans or processes. Resources in this toolkit were drawn from many different sources, including, of course, USAID CLA framework, other implementing organizations, and even the private sector, including approaches such as Lean Six Sigma. These 17 tool, there are 17 tools in the toolkit currently. I'll speak about um, three of them specifically later in the presentation. And we're also applying our own adaptive management approach to the toolkit by regularly gathering feedback and updating the guidebook and tools accordingly. 
Next slide, please. So now I'll hand it over to my colleague, Mustafa, who will give a quick overview of this Feed the Future GRC All Army Worm activity. Uh, thank you, Daniel, for, 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 for your presentation. Uh, thank you, everybody, and good morning, good, after, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are. The Feed the Future, the management of four animal worm in May smallholder farmers project in DRC is funded by the United States Agency for International Development, USAID, and implemented by Lando Lakes 1937 in partnership with IITA, International Institute of Tropical Agriculture, and the private sector of affiliate Villa, Villa Crop Protection. The project is using a three component approach. For the first component, IITA has provided the research and validation of safe and cost effective integrated pest management technologies suitable for smallholder maize producers. VILA has been providing support to facilitate system adoption of suitable technologies and approaches that will build the resilience of smallholder producers and the supporting market, the supporting market system. In the second component, Venture 37 has been facilitating system adoption of technology and good agricultural, good agricultural practices and integrated pest management approaches through public awareness campaigns, trainings for farmers, and in new IPM practices, increasing input data capacity and promoting farmer and private sector investment in new technologies. For the third component, Venture 37 is strengthening the enabling environment through awareness raising among government ministries, developing policy and action plans, and strengthening response coordination through task forces. Activities got to contribute to the overall strategy by garnering, building, and commitment at all levels of enabling environment. The four activity, the, the four army work activity is helping improve the application of integrated pest management and good agricultural practices by smallhold farmers, may maize farmers working through public, private, and NGO channels and collaborators. The main objective of the project is to use selective IPM and gap approaches to help limit the damage to the uh, DRC maize crop from full army worm. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the full army worm project activities. The four projects started as a, as a five-year project extended to seven years in April 23. The geographic coverage was also extended from five to eight provinces. The program scope as well was extended to build to include food security and resilience activities in addition to controlling the fall army war. In addition to good agricultural practices and integrated pest management, the project is now working on integrated soil fertility management reduction of post-harvest losses, increased access to input and financial markets, warehouse system and community-based production. The project collaborators are national and provincial ministries of agriculture specialized agencies, including DEPOTE, which is a plant production agency, SNV, rural extension agency, Senafit Fertilizer, and other agriculture input. Senasem is a quality control and certification agency, we also work with INERA, the National Agricultural Research Institute, and its provincial centers are essential, are central in the project active field activities for food, for foundation seed provision and collaboration in for management. The project has close ties with provincial uh, farms organizations like Copagel, Umoja in uh, Okatanga, Fokako in Kasai Oriental, and, and many other in provincial. Uh, Organization. We also work with Kovanapak, a federation of a, a national federation of agricultural producers organization. The project works with commercial banks and a network of input suppliers, both from the low retail, village level retailers to medium and large suppliers of input. Next, please. The project activities are implemented in eight provinces. Implementation started in 2019 during the COVID pandemic in five initial provinces, which are South Kivu, Tanganyika, Hokutanga, Kasai Oriental, and Domani. The field activities started in September 2020 due to the COVID lockdown. 
farm was the first farm field school were, were conducted in all five provinces starting in May 2020, 2021. The five provinces participants have graduated from the farm field school curriculum and are now engaged in extension led field demonstration activities and food security and resilience activities. The new provinces which started uh, are which started the activity in 2023 are Congo Central, Kuilu, and Kinshasa in the in the in the Batike Plateau. The farm field school activities and the training of community facilitators started last September at the beginning of the cropping season. Next, please. The project to use local expertise. What is our, our embryo monetization approach is the project is using local expertise, like community facilitators, village private service providers that would have, which have been trained by the project staff and project partners and farm to farm volunteers on for on for, for animal control and safer use of pesticide. Private sector providers are input retailers and input are input retailers and trained pesticide spraying agents. We use local languages for awareness raising, that is deliverable, which are mainly Swahili, Chiluba, Lingua, Lingala, and Kikongi, depending on the provinces where we are operating. The project involves project participants in validation of project annual activities plan for community engagement. This is important because we just don't want to make our plans and dump, dump them to, 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 to beneficiaries or participants without them knowing what we want to do. We all, at, the, at all time of this project, at all stage of this project, we want all communities to be involved in what we're doing. Farmers, farmers organization, the Ministry of Agriculture Agencies, the Prodev, Sena SEM, Sena FIC, Sena SNV, and in the institutional, the national uh, and private are all involved in the, in the project, in the work plan, annual work plan, before we, we, we roll it in the first. We use participatory approach during technology validation by inviting farmers to visit the demonstration field at various plants, plant development stages. The objective is to collect farmers' choices among various treatments to learn more on technology adoption criteria. The project staff in the provinces collect feedback from maize producers and key people in the communities on project activities and approaches and what needs to be changed. This really will enable us to see what is working, what is not working, what needs to be changed, what, what needs to be kept and or improved. The project, adapts, the project adapts the project adaptation plan to farmers. We adapt our project implementation to farmers' agroecological condition. DRC is a vast country with diverse agroecological zone and rain and rain patterns. The rainy season differs from province's general location. Project field activities are implemented during the cropping seasons. Most of the provinces, provinces have two cropping, a long one and a short one. Next, please. Well, the main activities of the project are farm field school, which I guess most of you know, conducted in major ways production areas where we train community facilitators on good agricultural practices and integrated pest management. Facilitators are managing now, once once they are community facilitators are trained, they are managing the public school in the various territories of the provinces. The, our technical team and our laboratories do joint monitoring visit and collecting data that are inputted in our server for, 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 for data analysis. We do conduct extension led demonstration fields in all implementation area where farmers graduate. The first stage of the program implementation is uh, obviously training community facilitators. And the second phase is to house those community, uh, community facilitators be conduct uh, demonstration in their area, which most of them are out of the programs which Transforming another one, another activity, a major activity is transforming and formal. We so far in the initial provinces, we we, we created, we set up 331 farm field school groups. And we are turning those 331 into 227 legal economic interest groups 
آژه از فو فوزور و آفرانکو بوده و نوزی و این کوپراتیو فرم. This legal legally formed entities will conduct in village savings and loan association to mobilize internal resources by collecting uh, individual farmers' saving to provide short-term loans to group and uh, members and to come and to constitute personal deposit for future loans to to procure rural mechanization and infrastructure. The project will also support the and economic interest group or cooperative in setting up warehouse receipt system, start post harvest activities to cut down post harvest losses, and put in place community based seed system. To, since having uh, good improved varieties and good seed is a major constraint in, in, in all those provinces and almost in all provinces where we are implementing the project. We regularly, on a quarterly basis, uh, Conduct both a report session and uh, Daniel's guidance to learn more from data collected by the monitoring evaluation and and learning team. Daniel uh, will develop more on this. Thank you, Daniel. You have the floor. Great. Thank you so much, Mustafa. Uh, so now we'll share uh, how the project team has built a culture of learning. Since I said it's um, it's so important. I do first want to note that while we embrace a culture of learning and don't shy away from admitting mistakes, we recognize the vulnerable livelihoods of our program participants and always take a do no harm approach to ensure any missteps by the program don't result in any added strain for those individuals and their families. Next slide, please. So building a culture of learning, as I've said, is essential for effective adaptive, adaptive management. I'm going to start by providing a high level overview of what we mean by a culture of learning and the general steps the project team took to build their culture of learning. This process includes hiring adaptive employees, fostering a team where staff are open and willing to take risks and support each other in risk taking, and ensuring all staff have the skills and bandwidth to utilize data and other resources for learning purposes. As the project team was built out, we made a point of hiring staff with an adaptive oriented mindset and specific skills and experiences with learning and adaptive management. There are numerous questions that you can ask candidates to gauge this type of a mindset or experiences. USAID has a great resource to help with this. It's called Guide to Hiring Adaptive Employees, and we'll put a link to that guide in the chat. It's certainly not always possible to hire staff with extensive experience with adaptive management, and that's fine. The culture of learning can be built and instilled in a team. The number one way to do that is to ensure all team members feel psychologically safe. Now this term is, I'll definitely admit, is very strange, but what it essentially means is that there is a team climate where it's safe to take interpersonal risks and be vulnerable in front of each other. And all team members feel confident that no one on the team will embarrass, reject, or punish anyone else for admitting a mistake, asking a question, or offering a new idea. Leadership support is essential to creating a psychologically safe environment, but it definitely requires buy-in from all team members to be successful. The project team worked very hard to build this psychologically safe learning culture through several ways, which I'll go into more detail in the next few slides. And the final step to building a culture of learning is to ensure staff have the support and time needed to fully engage with data. This often means setting aside specific time throughout the year when staff can literally pause and reflect on how things are going, review data, consider what ad adaptations could be made. I'll go into more detail on how the project team has done this in the next slides as well. Next slide, please. Building a culture of learning is challenging, certainly in any context, but especially when team members are spread out across a country or countries, which is the case, of course, for this project team. The team has 16 staff, seven in Kinshasa, and nine in the eight project provinces. Plus, there are support staff like me who are based in the U.S. We've worked hard to build a culture of learning across this dispersed team, 
through regular virtual and in-person team meetings, regular and open communications across teams, meetings with other stakeholders, specific pause and reflect events, which I'll go into more later, and other activities. Building this culture of learning and adaptive management has been critical to empower project staff to voice observations and continuously learn and improve. Next slide, please. Sometimes the biggest barrier to adaptive management is time. Staff having the time to reflect on what they're observing and what the data are revealing, and then brainstorming potential changes and deciding how best to proceed. To help overcome this barrier, the project team has short quarterly pause and reflect sessions and hosted a longer two-day pause and reflect workshop in November 2022. The midterm evaluation had just been completed and the program was gearing up to expand due to anticipated additional funding from USAID. Prior to this workshop, project staff were already thinking about how to consider the midterm findings, stakeholder input, and their own observations and adapt accordingly. <clears throat> so the pause and reflect workshop provided a dedicated time for the team to dig into the data and think holistically about the project challenges and opportunities. Most of the staff were able to meet in person in Kinshasa for the workshop. However, due to travel issues, three staff joined remotely, as did some US-based staff. Everyone worked hard to ensure those at virtual attendees were included and engaged as possible throughout the process. You can see the picture of the three virtual attendees on the wall behind the in-person staff in this photo. We even wanted to make sure that they were included in our team photo. We used some fun activities to help the team engage with the data. For example, we created a fill in the blank activity, which is like the US game called Mad Libs. And you can see a picture of the activity in this slide. The activity is in French since all of the project staff are French speakers. For this activity, the team spent a few minutes reviewing indicators and selecting values from a table for the baseline values and then updated values for the midterm and filling in the blanks with those indicator values. Then we spent time discussing each of the indicators and the progress we've made since baseline. It was a lot more fun than staring at a giant Excel table with all the indicators and values. Next slide, please. For another activity during this workshop, we pretended we were journalists writing the headlines for a newspaper about the project. Here on the right, you can see the instructions that we wrote up for the teams, again, in French. In these instructions, we, were, we included descriptions of the project's main activities and the full indicator table. The team referred to this information as well as their own experiences as they discussed what they wanted to highlight in their headline. The team broke up into small groups to make these headlines, which as you can see from the pictures on the slide, included drawings in addition to the word headlines. Overall, it was a really great way to think through some of the key achievements of the project and have some fun. Next slide, please. For the final activity for this workshop, um, we did this pause in, in, during this pause and reflect. Um, it involved a series of tools, starting with a tool we call the five whys, and then moving into another tool called co-creating and prioritizing solutions. Prior to the workshop, the team identified a few key issues that they were run in, running into when implementing activities. During the workshop, we validated that these issues were still the key ones that we wanted to focus on. Then the team split into small groups and each group took one issue and used the five wise tool to dig into the underlying causes of the issue. You can see an example of what that can look like here on the screen. Uh, the example here on the screen is a very large issue. The small groups really focus on much more specific issues that they were experiencing. The point of this exercise is to identify the root cause or causes of issues. One of the teams, once the teams had completed this exercise, they briefly shared out what their results were to the broader group. Then we use the next tool to brainstorm solutions to these underlying causes. We left it open for the team to suggest any idea they had, even if it would be really expensive or involve complex changes to the program, since sometimes crazy ideas can lead to identification of more feasible ones. We didn't want to, ex and we didn't want to exclude any idea at first. Once we had a long list of, of ideas, we used this impact effort matrix to prioritize which solutions would be the most feasible and have the highest impact. Once we added the key ideas to the matrix, we used it to help us update our work plan and move forward with any programmatic adaptations. 
The added benefit of all these engaging activities is that they also serve as team building activities and further strengthen the team's learning culture. Next slide, please. Now I'll pass it over to Mustafa to speak a little bit more about some other activities that the team is doing to build culture. Uh, Mustafa, if we lost him, I will go ahead and, oh, you are there. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm sorry, I was muted. Uh, thank you, thank you, Dania, for your presentation. Uh, Bidding a culture of training, of learning in our project is really, uh, there are many ways, but I'm just gonna talk about a, a few of them. The project is organized a bi-weekly all staff meeting to discuss project performance and implementation concerns in by province. Each of our province uh, with agronomists will detail what uh, what he or she basically do, uh, had encountered during the implementation for the two weeks. We do conduct a regular after action review to support learning through implementation activities. It is recommended to take some time to order an, an after action review. The review is conducted after the completion of an activity in the field as follow. Maybe 15 to 30 minutes at the end of an activity of training, workshop and etc. Or one to two hours within three days of activity organization process, surveys, joint mission, etc. We do discuss uh, quarterly report performance indicator and any deviation, any more than 10% deviation up or down from the target needs to be analyzed and lessons learned from the deviation. Why this has happened, what was the problem, was the technical, was it logistical, and et cetera. We conduct post and reflect session every quarter as a, uh, a learning tool. And this has been well developed by by Daniel, but we are not we are not going as thoroughly as Daniel did in November when he came in uh, in DRC. Next, Daniel, you have the, the panel. Great, thanks, Mustafa. Next slide, please. Adaptive management provide requires providing the right time, right data at the right time to the right people. Now this might seem obvious, but it can be very challenging, especially in the context in which we work as global development professionals. I'll go briefly through each of these three components and describe how the project team is continuously working to achieve this. Next slide, please. Getting the right data involves the right time and the right people too. To get high quality data, we need to be asking the right questions at the right time to the right people. This can be limited by budget constraints, time constraints among both staff and program participants and other factors. So to help um, uh, make sure that we're getting the right time, right data for this project, we have a detailed monitoring evaluation and learning plan that describes all the processes, timelines, and individuals involved in implementing our monitoring evaluation and learning activities. This plan has been essential for helping us implement everything that I just mentioned, all of our learning, monitoring evaluation and learning activities and identify ways to improve these activities. For example, this past year, we conducted an additional survey with farmers right at the end of our main cropping season, even though it didn't align with our reporting timelines because we wanted to get higher qual quality data from farmers. We kept the survey as brief as possible by focusing just on the data that was most important to collect at that time to reduce survey fatigue among farmers and keep costs within our budget. This project also has a rigorous evaluation methodology. The project prioritized a relatively large budget for monitoring and evaluation, which meant that we've been able to collect data not only from program participants, but also from comparison farmers. Comparison farmers are farmers in the same village as our farmer field schools, but they are not farmer field school participants and therefore not direct program participants. Since there are many factors that influence yields in any given cropping season that are outside the influence of the program, such as weather, it's helpful to have a comparison group of farmers who are experiencing these same factors, but without the direct support of the program. Having these comparison farmers has allowed the program to be able to draw more direct conclusions regarding the impact that the project is having. This picture, in fact, is of a program participant on the right and a non-participant on the left. Of course, data do not only come from our standard monitoring and evaluation activities. Observations from staff are very important data points that should be considered. 
The project's staff are regularly making and sharing observations regarding our work. As I've noted already, having a strong culture of learning is very important to ensure everyone feels comfortable and empowered to share their observations and make suggestions. The project has also reviewed external resource, research and other data to inform our adaptive management. And the final factor um, that can influence getting the right data is actually sort of after you have data, it's how data are presented. So very few staff have time to read long reports. Because of that, we've focused on using data visualizations to help staff understand our data. For example, for our midterm evaluation, we ensured we had many charts and other data visual visualizations to make it easier to understand the data and findings. Such visualizations are also much more likely to be reviewed than long reports. I'll show a few of those charts in the next slide. Additionally, using interactive activities like the ones we did during our pause and reflect workshop can help teams engage with the data. Thanks. So now in terms of putting it all together, right data at the right time for the right people. This came together in this pause and reflect workshop I mentioned that we held last November. So I've already mentioned several factors that we, we took in to get the right data. In terms of the right time, the workshop was held at an important time for the project because it was midway through the original five years of the project and the team was eager to see how to implement the remaining years of the project. Plus there was additional funding opening the door for expansion into new provinces. In addition, the midterm evaluation had just been finalized. So the team was able to leverage those data plus lots of other data sources during the workshop. In terms of people, we did our best to get all the right individuals in the room, whether it was in person or virtual, including key partners. Next slide, please. One of the key learnings from the midterm was related to farmer field schools. The midterm evaluation identified that these schools were key to disseminating effective and locally tailored integrated pest management and good agricultural practices to farmers. This was evidenced by two key met metrics. Farmer field school participant farmers estimated an 11% reduction in the amount of maize lost to fall armyworm and yielded 13% more maize per hectare compared to the co comparison farmers. You can see this lower amount of maize lost in the chart on the left and the higher maize yields on the right. These findings from the midterm aligned with observations the team members had already been making over the two plus years of implementing activities. Program staff had been observing these positive benefits of the farmer field schools. They were also observing some challenges when implementing the farmer field schools, and these similar challenges were also noted in the mid midterm. For example, the schools were so dispersed, it was very difficult for program staff to visit and support them with any frequency. Because of this, the project team had already decided to consolidate farmer field schools so they would be closer to each other. Additionally, the team had also already decided to continue to provide training to the community facilitators so they would feel better equipped to lead and manage the schools. It was great that the team had already begun making adaptations and that the midterm supported that they were making the right adaptive decisions. Farmer field school sustainability was another discussion topic that had been in the works prior to the workshop and was reinforced during these workshop discussions. As Mustafa already noted, the project is starting to implement various approaches to make the schools more sustainable, such as working with the participants to help them form more formalized legal groups. And this will help the farmers access financial products and services through microfinance institutions and banks, make bulk input purchases, aggregate maize to reach new markets, and increase bargaining power. You can read more about these findings, including a specific story of an impressive woman fields, farmer field school participant who's teaching many of her neighbors about what she's learning in the school in our Insights Hub. We'll put a link to that in the chat. Next slide, please. Now I'll pass it over to Mustafa to speak about some of uh, the learnings that we've had. Uh, thank you, Daniel, for your presentation. Uh, hello again. Uh, in terms of learning, uh, we, we have had some failures. But the major one who was a very fact is that in the first two years of the project, IITA and INERA, the National Research Institute, conducted the in-station research in two different agrological zones, representing of DRC diverse ecologies to adapt to approaches, practices, and technologies that need more scientific, rigorous scientific. The in-station in trials do not expose farmers to the early phases of technology validation process. And for a five-year project, time is a limiting factor. 
And what we did to solve this problem was by mid-2022, IITA project staff within Iraq started on farm demonstration trial, during which farmers were invited to visit the trials at different stage of the plant growth. In 2023, Venture 37 technical team worked with community facilitators to set up demonstration fields, which are extension and project-led. Several treatments, treatments, including the farmers' practices, are compared to improved practices recommended by IITA. Uh, next, please. A second failure was the very fact that uh, uh, the slow start of engaging input retailers into the project and implementation it impacted farmers' exposure to improved technologies and the adoption rate improved practices in areas where the key agricultural inputs were not available. And most of the time were where also sometimes the project wasn't present. And the solution we found was to provide grants to agricultural input retailers in Lomami and Kasai Oriental as a pilot test, which really resulted in 68 good agricultural practices and input in, uh, integrated pest management awareness raising events on full, on full amylum control and the use of appropriate agricultural products in the first six months. The beneficiaries created 75 new selling points, 47 remote villages, including 36 where the project did not enter activities at all. In the six months of, of their activities, their sale increased by 440%, which is really a, a major, a significant uh, performance. The participants in agro, agro, agro dealers awareness session come from remote villages where the project was not able to carry out activities. The input retailers conducted field demonstration session on responsible management of pesticide, the effective use of sprayers, and the mixing of agro chemical solutions. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to tell you about one success story. One of the uh, uh, they are always over, all was all two uh, uh, input retailers were very successful, but I'm just going to talk about Refine, who is one of the, of the two who first received a grant to extend his geographic coverage. In August, August September 22, he went through trainings and co creation session with the project technical team. Milestone was set and Refine invested in, in three new input shops within two months. The use of quality agricultural input is a limitation, as you know, to improve technology adoption due to the lack of knowledge and input availability in, in mass production areas. Grant providers to the project by the project to input retailers created great access to input to mass smallholder farmers. Griffin alone created 30, 30 new selling points in, 20, in 28 remote villages not covered by the project. Refine provided input to all selling points, cutting farmers' burden to travel far away to, 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 to purchase those, those, those inputs. Refine also organized awareness raising session in remote areas to explain to mass farm producers how and when to use the input and how to select quality, quality inputs. All awareness uh, sessions organized by Refine was conducted in Chuluwa, the, the local language in Lomami and, and, and Kasai Oriental. Thank you. Next, Danielle. Great. Thanks, Mustafa. So I'll just uh, briefly end by just, you know, kind of going over the main points here again. Adaptive management approach um, is really a continuous work in progress and should be tailored to the specific context in which we work. Of course, there are a few overarching themes that are foundational for, for strong adaptive management, and those are building a learning culture, considering all data, and then making time to pause and reflect as regularly as possible. I think we have a, a limited time here for questions, but I'll pass it over to Rebecca if we've had any questions to come in. That have come in. Yeah, yeah unfortunately, I think we, we, we have, have run out of time. Um, we're on the hour now, so we will not be able to, to get to some of the questions that were, were asked. But I, I, I want to thank everyone for participating again, and apologies for not getting to your questions. We will be sharing the recording for this webinar externally. If you'd like to learn more about Venture 37 and USAID's Feed the Future initiative, you can do so by visiting our websites. I believe Elizabeth is sharing the website links in the chat. 
I also want to take this time to thank all of our panelists, Jamie, Mustafa, and Danielle. Thank you for sharing your insights on the importance and application of adaptive management in agricultural programs and how it can contribute to building programmatic resilience and help us achieve better outcomes for project participants. I also want to thank the organizers of the Borlaug Dialogue, the World Food Price Foundation for their support to this webinar. Lastly, I want to thank everyone for joining. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.